Welcome everybody to the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I hope you're having a good time. Welcome back in person. This is so exciting to see authors in person again. Um, I, my name is Sasha Dowdy. I'm supposed to tell you about this boring grown up before we get into the good stuff, but I work at the Library of Congress and I'm one of the people who gets to put together book programs at the library and I work with the kids. So that is the best thing ever. And this is the ultimate collection of book programs, the National Book Festival. And it cannot happen without our sponsor. So thank you to our sponsors. And just by the way, I'm subbing in for my friend, Stephanie Handy. She works at Library of Congress as well, but couldn't make it today. And the smart questions are hers and the silly ones are mine. Uh, so I hope you all got something signed, ate some snacks, did something fun, and we're going to talk about kids who eat snacks and take breaks, but they also change the world. And they are still kids, and we're gonna talk about those two things. Uh, this panel is called, How Many Times Do Kids Have to Save the World? Deep Adventure Stories, with authors Lev Grossman, and Julianne Randall. You'll find out all about them, but before we dive in, I just want to tell you that we will have a chance to ask these authors questions during the last 10 minutes of the program, and you can also go to their signing at 5.30 to 6.30. All right, we can get started. And we'll go with the general information. Could you please tell us about yourself and the book that you're presenting today? Oh man, I didn't know you were gonna ask that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my name's Lev, uh, and I am a writer, and I wrote a book called The Silver Arrow, um, uh, which was about uh, a kid who discovers that the Earth is encircled by an invisible network of train tracks, and these trains uh, have as their clients animals. True. And then I wrote a book called The Golden Swift, where she rides around in the train some more. Fantastic. Thanks. Julian? Cool. What's up, y'all? Uh, can y'all hear me all right? Cool. All right. My name is Julian Randall. I'm the author of Pilar Ramirez and the Escape from Zafa. It is a story about a 12-year-old black Dominicana aspiring documentary filmmaker. Uh, she is from Logan Square, Chicago, just like me, and she has been trying to put together a documentary about her cousin, Natasha, who disappeared 50 years ago during the Trujillo regime, which dominated the Dominican Republic for 31 years. So she's been asking her mommy, she's been asking her abuela, she's just trying to get some information, but as is often the case when we're asking older family members about like hard periods in their lives, she's not making much progress. Until one day, she finds herself sucked through a page, like a blank page inside of a folder, which has her disappeared cousin's exact name and date of disappearance on it, and finds herself in the magical world of Zafa, which has been dominated by the Dominican boogeyman El Cuco for hundreds of years. So now she has to find her power, find her history, and find her way back home. It's a very, very straightforward story. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was getting tossed around with both of these books, which was super fun. So let's talk about heroes. We see a lot of like Captain America or Batman, all these adults who get to be heroes. So why was it important to you to show kids as heroes in your books? Do you wanna go? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at the risk of sounding like I'm pandering, honestly, kids have always been my heroes, even back when I was a kid. And my mom's is here, so she will be able to tell you. She'll stand next to the signing line, it'll be cool. But it was also about the fact that, you know, at the moment that you're starting to think about the world that you are inheriting, you want to be someone who is powerful enough to shift it to better be gentle and hold the people that you love, right? Like you wanna just be able to make things just a little bit better, but nobody ever necessarily listens to you. So realistically, kids have the best understanding of what power actually is and what it looks like, and it's who the power should be with. So I wrote a book where the power is with the kids. <laughs> Sweet, it only makes sense. How about you, Lev, especially since you wrote a whole series of books for adults? Uh, that's true. Um, when I was little, when I was a kid, I definitely, I didn't feel like a hero mm -hmm. at all. I was very conscious of the ways in which I didn't have much power. Uh, and um, I continued in that state until I was about 35 years old. Uh, when I realized, actually, it was okay to 
put yourself out there and try to make things better around you. Uh, and when you do that, you take on huge amounts of responsibility and your life gets much more complicated and interested. interesting. And I wish that I had realized one of that when I was about 11 years old. Mm -hmm. So I went back and I wrote about uh, a, a kid who did, who figured that out. I, became, I was very good at figuring out reasons not to do things. Mm -hmm. I was so good at that. Um, uh, even now, my, I, when I have children, my, my children say, you know, let's go, let's save the, let's save the animals. Um, uh, and, and I say, okay. And they say, we're going to do a lemonade stand mm -hmm. and we're going to make money and then uh, uh, we're going to give it to the people who save animals for a living and that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to save the animals. And I was like, but it's COVID. And look, it's like 63 years, no one's going to want lemonade out there and I have to go to get lemons. Uh, and you know, lemonade, it's, it's a lot of sugar in that. So on and so forth. I, was so, I'm, I still am so good at thinking of reasons not to do things. Um, yeah. uh, kids are not so good at that. They just go out and do things, and I really admire them for it. I do too, actually. That's a really good way of putting it. Kids are brave. You guys, you have all the time in the world to do the things you want. So these authors are here to give you that power. So, Lev, you mentioned that you didn't see yourself as a hero, so I wanted to know when did you first see yourself as a hero or even a person who could do things on their own? Start get, taking control. I mentioned, the, the, I mentioned when I turned 35. Um, Great. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it was really finding myself, um, this is, seems like a sort of glib thing to say, but it's actually true. I, I'll sound like a grown-up who's lying, but I'm actually telling the truth. It was when I figured out that I could be a writer that I really started to feel powerful. Um, you read so many stories about ki people, kids, who are discovering that they have a secret gift in themselves and a secret power in themselves. Um, Harry Potter discovers that he is a wizard. He didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And I managed to make it to the age of about 35 really believing that either that was just a fairy tale and not true, or it was like a metaphor for something and I didn't really understand. It's not a metaphor. You do have gifts inside yourself and power, the power to do things you never believed that you could do. Um, and one day, you will discover what that power is. Uh, and I did, and you will. And that's when I felt like a hero for the first time. And it won't take you 35 years. You'll do it like really soon. Good. How about you, Julian? When did you see yourself as a hero? Okay, so I thought that I was the protagonist of life for like 12 years. Um, Main so character energy. Ultimately, like, you know, a big author energy, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that I was the protagonist of life for like 12 years and I just hadn't necessarily discovered where my uh, power-ups were. And then I read The Golden Compass by Philip Pullman and that was one of the bits, well, it was one of the biggest like shifts for me in terms of thinking about, okay, in the book, in like in the Golden Compass, like Lyra finds that she has the result of like thousands and thousands of tiny factors that have made her into the person that she is, and that made me think because I was twelve and I was like, okay, well, I guess I am the culmination of all of these things that have happened to me. So, what if I could also happen to things? <laughs> so I started trying to think of ways to make stories about kids who were like me and had powers that were sourced from things that were important to me. Because it's lovely to be able to save the city, but sometimes you just want to be able to save your neighborhood. Sometimes you just want to be able to save your abuela. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The power comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Did you want to add something? I really admire your books because not only do you give kids that power to be heroes, you also talk about the environment and get them to care, and you talk about history that a lot of kids may not know about. So what made you want to write about it, and how did you make it so easy for kids to understand these things? Maybe we can start with history. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, as far as the environment is concerned, I think that was actually really like one of the first things about Pilar that like unlocked. Because at first, the first thing that comes in, she just, is a character who walked into my head, says, I'm Pilar Ramirez, I'll be taking it from here, and she's been <laughs> dancing on my last nerve ever since, right? So I started putting together these sample chapters. She gets to Zafa, and I see that like, all of the sand is like bleached white. 
and that's the way that I see it in my head, but it feels like something is wrong, like it wasn't always this way. And so in Zafa, the, the land used to be covered with this sentient black sand that contains all Dominican mythos and memory, everything that has ever happened to our entire diaspora is contained inside of here, right? But when El Cuco made his deal with Trujillo, it started to bleach the island and it started to turn the sand. And so Pilar understands what it is to be from a place that used to love you and used to know how to love you and specifically used to know how to love the black of you, which is something that we struggle so much with in Dominican culture, right? But now the land is starting to forget. And we see that all over the place. We see it in Jackson, Mississippi right now with the water shortage. We see it in Pakistan where there is this flood that has wiped out thousands and thousands of homes. And this is the world that we're inheriting, but also the environment that we can work in concert with can allow us to be more powerful, can allow us to mm -hmm. be heroes. And so I wanted to make a collaborative magic that was inextricably tied to both blackness and what it means to take care of the land. That's amazing. I did not think about that metaphor. That's a really good one. What about you, Lev? Why did you want to write so intimately about the environment? Um, I didn't want to. I, okay. I, I didn't want to. <laughs> I wanted to write about talking animals because I really like them. I always loved stories that had talking animals in them. I always loved the Narnia books. I always loved books like um, James and the Giant Peach. Uh, I always felt more comfortable writing from the point of view of an animal than a human being. I don't know what that says about me. And I started to write this story about uh, a girl who um, finds herself the conductor of this train and the passengers, are, passengers, passengers on the train are animals. But when the animals began to speak, something interesting happened. Because those books that I mentioned, the Narnia books and, 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 and Roald Dahl and stuff like that, those were books where they were written 60, 70, 80 years ago. And a lot has changed in our relationship with animals and the whole natural world since then. And everybody knows this. They know it, or at least they can feel it. Uh, and so the conversation that takes place when you talk to a magical talking animal, it's not the same conversation it used to be. When, you, when the Pevensies and went to Narnia and they met Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver were so psyched because the humans are here and they're going to save the world. Mm -hmm. Well, when the animals show up, I mean, the humans show up and the animals start talking, the humans have got a lot of explaining to do um, because they are not necessarily here to save the world. They're, in fact, the people who have messed up the world. Uh, and it's a very complicated thing to try to understand. Grown-ups struggle with it just as much as kids do. Fortunately, it's the kids' problem much more than the grown-ups' problem at this point. Uh, we all struggle with it. And it's a, it relates to being a hero because when uh, up to the point where Kate, who's the hero of the Silver Arrow and the Golden Swift, starts talking to the animals, she's fairly confident that she is the hero of the story mm -hmm. that she is in. Right. And something that she discovers when she begins to talk to the animals is that she's not the hero, she's the villain. And where does she go from there? It's complicated. Yes, and I really like the character of Kate because you let her fail. And I love Pilar because she, you allow her to fail yeah. and the things around them. So we are taught to make mistakes and then you get back up and you can do it again, but your characters make permanent choices. So how did you allow your kids to make such huge mistakes? Because the, the kids are like, you're, you birthed them from your brain and I don't know, that seems like a really, really brave thing to do to analyze that responsibility. Um, it's, a, it's a funny thing to say for somebody who writes fantasy novels about, and novels about magic, but I'm very interested in reality. Mm -hmm. Reality is of great concern to me, even though I really like stories about people who can do magic. Uh, and um, one of the great rules when you're writing a book for me, when I'm writing a book that has magic in it, is that magic, the very most important and difficult problems and urgent problems, magic can't solve those ones. Magic can solve a lot of stuff, but not the big ones. Mm -hmm. And so you can't wave a wand and make climate change or the damage that human beings have done to the environment go away, um, uh, which is challenging because 
when you get to the end of the book, the problem, that problem is not solved. Right. Um, and it's a challenging thing to write about and it's a challenging thing uh, to read about. Um, but um, one thing that I've, I've learned uh, from being a parent and being around a lot of kids is that kids are very good at knowing when you're lying. And for the book to end with nature fixed and everything okay, that would have been a lie. Right. Kids want that honesty and they can handle it. That's the other thing. They can handle so much more than they're given credit for. Absolutely. How about you, Julian? Can you tell oh. me about that? Oh, I started sweating for a second because you're <laughs> stepping on the um, thing I was going to say, which is for me, like, it is also about that, uh, it is a partially about magic not being able to solve the larger problems like you were saying. It is also about just straight up respect for your readers, right? Like, young people, we write lots of books that promise them that everything is going to be okay. In fact, not only is everything going to be okay, everything's going to be great. <laughs> everything's going to be wonderful. And when bad things happen to kids in all kinds of in kinds of in all kinds of stories, it just kind of goes away, or we don't necessarily talk about it again. And I don't. That was not my experience of being a kid. That was not been my experience yeah. <laughs> of being alive. So why would we structure a story in that way when we know that kids also live with the consequences not only of their actions but of ours? So realistically, like Pilar Ramirez ends up being like this intergenerational story about mm -hmm. like, yes, the Trujillato happens in the 1930s, ends in the 1960s, right? But this is still something that, that then moves a whole generation of folks over to the Americas. And then a third generation, a third culture, kids like me, like Pilar, who have all of these questions about this place that we came from that we can't go back to, yeah. or that we can't reach, or this family member that we can't see anymore. And all of those things are lasting consequences that kids are curious about, and mm -hmm. that also impact the choices that they make about their lives. So ultimately, I just wanted to respect y'all that y'all were able to keep track of this. Yeah, absolutely. So when I read a book about the environment or just am faced with it out in the world, maybe I'll donate something and I'm like, great, but you didn't solve the problem. How do you keep your characters caring about this thing that's not going to be solved anytime soon? Julian, do you want to go first? How do you keep caring? And it doesn't even have to be about characters, just in general. You know, I think that like the process, somebody said this on Twitter and I'll be forever upset that I didn't write down who it was who said it because I cite this quote all yeah. the time, but they were talking about the real distinction between like adult lit versus like YA versus middle grade is like access to hope, right? Is that when you're an adult, it becomes kind of like not cool <laughs> to have like hope about, a, hope about a situation. And I think that I have tried to allow my books to be a kind of optimism in offering it to young people and saying like, I wanna be honest with you that I believe things are wrong and I also believe in your power to continue the work of trying to make it right because I don't think that there's necessarily an alternative that leads to a world I want to live in. Mm -hmm. So I write books because I believe in the power of like young people's imaginations. <laughs> And it is an incredible thing. How about you, Liz? I guess I'll, I'll just—I guess I'll just add that um, it's—it's uh, um, it's very important for me when I write about animals to try to make them think and talk the way animals would, not like somebody wearing an animal suit who's really mm -hmm. a person, but actually coming from that place that animals do. And you know, one thing about uh, uh, that about animals is. Um, they, the animals never give up. They, they, right. ne they never give up. <laughs> For better um, or worse. They don't despair. Um, they don't sit around uh, in a miasma of shame and guilt and self-reproach. Um, they solve problems and they look forward. And very often as, uh, a, a, as a human um, living in this world, uh, which has been compromised in the way that our world has been, it's very easy for me to descend into a miasma um, and think, oh, it's so terrible what we've done and so on and so forth. Um, animals don't care about that. They don't care if we feel guilty or not. Nope. 
It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference to them. They are into, uh, look, you'll, you can look on YouTube sometime, and there's a great video of a rat trying to drag a piece of pizza up a flight of stairs. It's amazing. It goes on for 20 minutes, and finally, the rat gets that piece of pizza to the top of the stairs. And it's just, you look at it, and you think a human would never, ever have kept going. And Only maybe an exceptional one, but animals will just keep going. Yeah, and um, uh, what I hope is that, is that, is that uh, Kate and, and, and all of us can learn from animals in that respect, because um, uh, they don't give up, and we can. Yeah. That's true. Put yourselves in the brains of the animals. And we, while we care and consider where we came from and all these big things, sometimes you get stuck and you don't know where to go next. And writers especially might get stuck. You don't know what to write next. So how do you deal with that? We all get stuck. Are we stuck now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. I, I know what I want to say. I'm trying to figure out how uh -huh. I want to structure it. OK. Can we go to you first? Um, usually, uh, when I get stuck, I sit down, and I grit my teeth, and I try even harder, and I stare even harder at my computer mm -hmm. screen. Um, and um, I remain in that posture for the next eight hours, and then I go to bed, and I start the next day. Um, oh, wow. Okay. I'm really, it's getting unstuck, I find, very hard. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the only thing I've ever found that is helpful is um, meditation, okay. which I, I only started doing a few years ago. Um, meditating is really good. Usually when I get stuck, I'm already in such a bad mood that I can't even mm -hmm. meditate, and it's too late. Yeah. Um, but that is what I ought to do when I want to get up unstuck, is to sit and try to calm down and remember how to focus my attention. That's great. Good advice. Word up. I love that. Um, I'm thinking about this conversation that Marlon James had with Daniel Jose Older for the, I think, the fiction nonfiction podcast, mm -hmm. where he said, like, your plot problems aren't plot, thank you, uh, the, your plot problems, problems aren't plot problems, your plot problems are character problems, mm -hmm. like, nine times out of ten. And so if I feel stuck, it's often because I am either without a character to follow or one of the characters that I have already made is not doing the thing that they actually want to be doing. They're doing the thing that I want them to be doing. So to give like an example, right, like Pilar is the first part of a two-part series. The second one is called Pilar Ramirez and the Curse of San Zenon, and it follows Pilar's first journey to the island, and there's a storm that only she can see, right? And so as it was going, I was like, okay, this is good, this is good, but something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. Something wasn't clicking. And I figured out that it was because in the original version of the book, the antagonist was supposed to die. And I realized that the reason the antagonist was dying was because that was what I'd been taught. That was what I came up with, like by and large in kid media when I was growing up. If there was a villain, the villain died, and then you right. maybe saw them in the sequel, but probably not because the contrasts go up. But mm -hmm. um, I didn't want that. I wanted a imagining of like what could it be to be more restorative in this so i had to sit and like kind of do a, a similar kind of meditation where i was i waited for the antagonist to come to my head and say like okay i'm listening please tell me why are you like this <laughs> <laughs> why have you made this choice <laughs> i feel like that's a question that applies to animals too and mm -hmm. that thing the consistency and the way they'll just keep pushing it's a good thing to open your mind to so what i like about these books is that they have these huge worldwide problems to solve that they can't solve alone. They have to keep going. There are sequels. The story continues. But at the same time, there are still kids. Like Kate is uh, seeing her classmate getting bullied and is like, what do I do? Or Pilar is dealing with her sister, who is a bit of uh, annoying and being a big sister. <laughs> and uh, so. Talk about that, the balance of real kid problems and these like heroic deeds that they do. Um, yeah, it's funny. Uh, in early on in the, um, the Golden Swift, Kate has an experience, which I also had, um, which was that she auditioned for a part uh, in the musical Anything Goes. That was the school musical that year. And she really wanted to get a lead, like really wanted it. Um, and um, she didn't get a lead because she's really bad at singing. Mm. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and almost worse than that is not only she did not get a lead, but she did get put in the chorus 
and she was really upset and angry about it, but she couldn't quit because that would make her seem like a sore loser, which right. she was a sore loser, but she didn't want to seem like a sore loser mm. to everybody. Uh, uh, this happened to me in seventh grade. It also happened in eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, and eleventh grade. Mm -hmm. I finally got a good part in the twelfth <laughs> grade show because of pity. <laughs> <laughs> Never give up. That's um, <laughs> right. Never get up. I got that piece of pizza to the oh, top good. of the stairs. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, um, the funny thing was that that hurt. It hurt as much as the <laughs> as the climate of the Earth being destroyed. They hurt the same amount. It's yeah. weird that 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 should that should hurt much more that the Earth is getting destroyed. But that may not. They hurt the same amount. And I wanted to be honest and kind of reflect that mm -hmm. in the Golden Swift. That you know, emotionally, just from a purely emotional point of view, they weigh the same, even yeah. though they're not the same. Sometimes kids are made guilty because they don't want to finish their broccoli. Well, there's kids who don't have broccoli somewhere out in the world, but you can't care the same way about the things that are right in front of you. So that's why we got to keep trying, right? <laughs> Word, yeah. I think in so far as like kid problems versus world problems, I often find that my the kid problems that come up in my work are really just world problems that have kind of trickled down at a certain mm -hmm. level. You know, we have the nature of how Pilar's relationship with her abuela, her relationship with her mommy, her relationship with Lorena, all of it runs around this central family trauma, right, of how mm -hmm. Natasha disappeared. So there's that, right? And at the less Zafa-focused level, she is from the same neighborhood in Chicago that I am from, which is now unrecognizably gentrified, right? right? And the way that she understands this is that her best friend moved away. Mm -hmm. And when you're a kid, like, I don't know about you, but I had one maybe I had two best friends. <laughs> and if one of them moved away, which she did, I was devastated. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I had a lot of free time to just kind of like pour into these little side projects and whatnot. And so Pilar is dealing with a third kid problem, right? Of like, I have this talent and this story to tell, but I don't necessarily have a means by which I'm going to do it, or I don't know how to do it. So she idolizes this, uh, director who I made up, Mira Paredes, mm -hmm. who she watches all of her YouTube channels. And that's what ultimately gets her to think like, oh, word, I could make a documentary about this question that I've had my entire life that affects my whole family. And then she gets sucked through a blank piece of paper. And she's like, well, this is not what I was expecting. <laughs> I did not sign up for this. <laughs> not even a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we don't get to sign up to be heroes, really. So really. Gotta deal with the problems you came in with and this new world saving stuff. Yeah, it's that Gandalf Long quote, time. right? Uh, so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. Ooh, it's a good quote. Remember everyone, this is recorded, so you can come back and watch this for the wisdom flying around on the stage right now. Um, I am pretty sure that this is time for Q&A. Let me check my watch. Yes, so if you have a question, please come up to the mic and take, we're going to take turns we're going to go that way and then that way, et cetera, until we run out of time. So you look like you're ready. Go ahead. Um, my question is, how long do these books take? How long did it take to write them or how long? How long did it take to write them? I'll tell you, but the answer may depress you. Uh-oh. Um, it takes me about two, it took me about two years to write The Silver Arrow, maybe a year and a half to write The Golden Swift because I already thought of some of the characters. Um, I write slowly. It took me a long time. Okay, thanks. Mine took a year. Also, I love your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead on my right side. Is there gonna be a book after the Golden Twist? Mm. You know, I, w I had dinner with my sister the other day, um, and uh, my sister's older than me, and she asked me that same question, and then she said, I already thought of a title. You have the Silver Arrow and the Golden Swift. Why don't you call it the Lead Balloon? <laughs> My sister is 56 years old, ladies and gentlemen. If you think that your siblings might one day grow up and become more mature, <laughs> they never will. They will never change. Um, uh, uh, there will be another book. I've got it all figured out in my head, but I haven't written it down yet. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, like. 
is it hard to write the books or is it easy to write the books? Mm. It varies, honestly. Like, some scenes are really difficult to write, and then some scenes I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is going so quickly. I am the greatest writer of all time. <laughs> I could write 12 of these this year. <laughs> it, it's, it's true. Um, some bits are easy, uh, and, and, and um, some bits are, 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 um, uh, are really hard. Uh, there's a passage in one of my books for adults that Everybody who reads it comes to me and says, I love that one passage. That was the best part of the book. And I think back about, how did I do that? That was the one bit where I became a great writer for like a day. Yeah. What happened? It's just an ordinary, I didn't feel it wasn't any different from any other day. Um, I don't know why some bits are hard and some are easy. Um, uh, um, it's one of the mysteries of being a writer. But encountering a bad day means there's gonna be a good day sometime in the future. Does it mean Hopefully. that? Hopefully. <laughs> I never give up. We all have hope. All right, we have a question on this side. Did you have a job before you became an author? Oh, such a good question. Such a good question. Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, yeah, I worked in, so I worked in publishing and before that I was in grad school. But yeah, so I made books for different readers and then I signed the contract to write this and I was like, I would like to do this more. <laughs> I had so many jobs uh, before I became a writer. And in fact, I did a lot of my writing while I had another job, which is, uh, 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 this is another depressing but true fact that I will tell you. If you're interested in being a writer, probably you will have two jobs at the same time for much of your career. You will be uh, working during the day and then writing secretly during the night. You have a double life like a spy. It's kind of exciting. But it is, um, it's challenging uh, for a while. I, I, I had many jobs, and I didn't, um, uh, even though I thought of myself as a professional writer, I had a job until six years ago um, wow. when I was 46 years old. Um, wow. uh, so uh, uh, short answer, yes, I did have a job. Several. Several. What was the coolest? I was a reporter for um, a magazine, uh, and that was such a good job. I was so, so lucky to get that job. Nice. Journalism, everybody. All right, go ahead. How did you remember the Gandalf book? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Seen that movie way too many times. <laughs> but also, like, eidetic memory. <laughs> I was going to, I had a quote that I wanted to say during this panel, and I'm just going to say it out of context, because I memorized it for this panel. And we'll it was, a, it. it's an Ursula Le Guin quote, and it is, those who deny the existence of dragons are often eaten by them. From within. <laughs> it's the from within that tells you oh, that it's Ursula. So good. Anyway, there it is. Um, I've never read The Golden Swift, but it looks like there's another person in it. Is that person opposing the protagonist or Ooh. not? Oh, to tell you that would be to tell you, in some ways, the ending of the book. But um, because it was a sequel, I wanted to, to introduce another kind of level of complexity to the book. And so I added a kind of co-hero uh, to the book. So yes, and it's a complicated relationship that they have. Um, I think frenemies would be uh, a, a not an incorrect way to describe their relationship. Great. We only have a couple minutes left, so let's do quick bam, bam, bam kind of thing. All right. Um, so what made you think of the train system like, why did you make an invisible secret train system <laughs> other than a, like, any other vehicles? Um, uh, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, and I truly don't know the answer, um, except uh, to say that um, I have a deep love of trains. Um, trains have that, um, they, um, what do I want to say? They're super, super complicated, but they're not complicated like computers. They're not just little blocks of silicon that you look at and think, oh, I don't know what's going on in there. I never will. They're fascinatingly huge, like dinosaur-sized things. Um, but if you go through them and examine how they work, you can kind of figure it out. I love them. Ab I love that about trains. Um, and uh, uh, I take I, I, I take them whenever I can. 
back. What do you think is the ma the What do you think is the lasting effects of the books that you, you guys have? Wow, really wow. good question. <sighs> Wonderful question. I hope that um, <laughs> We're stuck again. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. I will get that piece of slice talk. up there, though. I will get okay. it up there. Oh uh, I think for me, there are so many intergenerational curses that are like put forth by events like the Trujillo, like the way that we're seeing climate change affect us. And I want kids to feel, coming away from the book, like you were always enough to break the curses that were foisted upon you. Fantastic. You are enough. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's such a good question. Uh, it, um, for me, it really has to do with um, that, that idea of keeping going. Um, there's so much hand-wringing and self-blaming and blaming of others around this question of, of um, what's happened to the climate and, and nature. It is in aid of nothing. Uh, all, that, all, all that there is is, is finding answers. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing else. I hope people remember that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We do have to stop right here, but the authors might answer your questions if you come up to the stage for a little bit. So let's give yeah. Lev, Gr Lev Grossman and Julian Randall a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for coming today. <laughs>